let's just riff. Okay. okay, I'm ready. I adore you. I'm so happy you're doing uh, Me too. <laughs> when I saw it on the thing, I mean, I don't remember, weeks ago, months ago. Oh, it was how a while I ago, yeah, yeah. Schedule, I like screamed because <laughs> I had mentioned to the publicist, I was like, I think Mila has a podcast. Could we do it? Because oh. they were like, what are your dream podcasts? And I was like, I don't know that I have a dream one, but I would like to do <laughs> the ones by people I know and love. And so I, I was like, we got to do Barnes and Noble's podcast. And so when I saw it on the thing, I was like, ah. so. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. And I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Port Over. And yeah, we're starting the show a little differently today because I have not seen Samantha Irby in more than a minute. And if it sounds like the two of us are just dorking out, well, guess what? We are because I love <laughs> you and I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> I love you. I'm so happy to see you. You and I want to say before I say anything else, well, I guess I already said some stuff, but I would not have this career truly without Miwa Messer. I won't tell the whole long story, I don't want to bore people, but long story short, I don't even know how you found my first book, it was on a little indie press in Chicago like six people were gonna read it you know it was like the kind of thing where I got no advance no nothing it was just like if you write this thing we will make it look like a book right and I don't know how you found it and picked it for oh my god what's the program called it, it, at the time it was called discover great new writers now yes. it's morphed into a different thing but at the time okay. when I was running it it was discover great new writers and I squealed when I finished it I, and we're talking about Meaty and not Meaty has been released by Vintage mm-hmm. and lots of folks have seen it with the new material and everything else. But we're talking about this tiny little <laughs> essay collection with a giant chicken on the front cover. And that's partially yeah. why I was like, what is going on here? What is the title <laughs> and the chicken? And I was like, what? And then I start reading because I didn't know about the blog at the time. And I was just reading. And there's that piece you wrote about you and your mom. Mm-hmm. And how your mom became your child when you yeah. were because your mom yeah. had MS and there were other complications. And we're, we're going to talk about some of that. And I just remember having my, just feeling like I needed to know who you were and what you were going to do next. And I just couldn't believe how funny you were, but also how dark some of the material was. And there was a real arc to mm-hmm. the book. Too. And there's been a real arc to your career. So it's been a delight to see all of these books <laughs> come out afterwards these awesome jackets and these great titles and watching people connect with you in a way that, I mean, and I read your book, the original one I read in what, 2012? It must've been more than a decade ago, Sam. Yes. Yes. You and I have been connected for a decade. Oh man. It's so great. It's so great. I mean, like knowing you, not my not like, oh, my career is so great. No, I mean, like, <laughs> having you in my corner has been so great. So I'm so grateful to you. I have to say it in front of the world. I've never sent you flowers. I should and I will. I'll send That's you okay. something, whatever you want, a bouquet of hot dogs, whatever you like. Because without you, there's no this. There's no me. And this is really important. This is really important. You talk about a lot of stuff. And yeah, it helps that it's funny, right? Like it helps yeah. that you are hysterically funny because Thank you. some of the stuff you're talking about, my friend, like having a body <laughs> that doesn't work properly, yeah. like that's something that a lot of us have been sort of working with with the last few years and the pandemic and lockdown and everything else. And we're learning stuff that we never knew before. And this has been your body. And yeah, you've talked about being fat. Like, let's not dance around it, right? Like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the episode you wrote for Shrill Pool (laughs) is kind of legendary, right? And I have to say, I rewatched it before we sat down to do this. And I was like, yeah, this is a really great episode. I like when I tell you like, okay, so everything about the shoot was like perfect right Mm -hmm, it's like mm -hmm. what you it was my first time on a set and I I mean I am definitely a person with I generally keep my expectations low because it's not that far to fall (laughs) when when whatever the thing is like doesn't live up to the expectation but 
we walked onto the set, Lindy West and I walked onto the set and they showed us the pool area. And it was like, from my dreams, I was like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. It looks like Candyland. Like, this is just gorgeous. But then there was like this little voice in the back of my head that was like, okay, they made it look good, but I bet all of the extras are like size eight. You know, like Hollywood yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the crime that we all thought, like, not we, but you know, America thought like Renee Zellweger in, yep. <laughs> in Bridget Jones was right. that. So I was like expecting to see all of these like beautiful, like curvy, you know, but not fat women. And I walked into the ballroom and everyone looked beautiful. They were making swimsuits for people. They were yeah. doing hair, makeup. And I looked at all of the bodies and I was like, they really did it. They're really going to let us put actually fat people in bikinis on television. And right. it was like, I mean, now, like now that I have been in this business for a few years, mm -hmm. uh, it still is shocking to me, like what a coup that was, you know, like it really felt like we were getting away with something. And now the further we get away from that time, but things haven't progressed at least in fatness on screen. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, we really did like literally get away with a Hollywood crime <laughs> by yeah. putting large people in bathing suits on TV. Like I, I truly feel like if that's my only mark on the television world, then that's fine. That's great. Everyone was so beautiful. Everyone was in like not a hair out of place. Like the whole no one's foundation was melting. I mean, it was <laughs> everyone looked fabulous. It it's so, so I it's so important. I mean, like we didn't you didn't have me here to talk about like fat stigma, but I mean, you know, the assumption that fat people are lazy or mm -hmm, stinky yeah. and always have a ham sandwich in their left hand or whatever right. it is, right? Like I certainly felt the pressure to like like everyone must be beautiful. We must show people yeah. like it, having the most fun and not feeling bad about themselves in any way or self-conscious in any way. I mean, you know what would have happened. Like if one person mm -hmm. would have had runny mascara, yeah. like someone would have said, uh, sweaty fat people <laughs> can't yeah. keep it together. Yeah. And like there wasn't, everybody looked amazing and I think like trying to move the needle on someone who like hates you. I don't know. That feels like a waste of time. So I I was never like, let's do this so we can convince people that we're real and we have feelings. It was like, no, our focus is just going to be people who look like us feeling seen by seeing their bodies represented on screen. And like, I got so much feedback mm -hmm. from people who were like, "It what a relief to just see that people on screen handled well. There were no slip and fall prat falls. Right. There were no, you know, the fat girl stuck in the beach chair. There was none of that. It was just like, look at us having a good time. And I feel really, really proud that we got to do that. Yeah, but that's exactly part of why I wanted to see you on the show, because honestly, <laughs> that representation is important. And that comes through all four of the books, mm -hmm. right? And you're also showing up in ways for mental health and you're showing up for ways with chronic disability. I mean, Crohn's disease. I just had an appointment with my GI yeah. to go over. I had a colonoscopy a few weeks ago and we went over that. And she was, <laughs> I mean, this is truly like the encapsulation of... Right having a disease uh she's like colonoscopy looked great you know okay. there's this this took out a polyp all the biopsies came back perfect and i'm like oh great am i actually about to get good news from a medical professional and then she was like so uh i want to get some imaging on the small bowel and we'd love to get a stool sample and i was just like I have all this good news and yet 
I got to go have another CT scan and then I got to poop in a hat and scoop it out and <laughs> turn it in. And it's like, you don't talk about that all the time, right? Because people would be bored. And in my everyday life, it's not, it's not like, you know, I need a scooter to get around or there's no like physical thing that indicates to people like, I'm having a bad day or I'm struggling or something in my body feels bad. But I feel like writing about it in as lurid detail as I do, it frees up something for me. It takes a weight off of me that honestly, I didn't even know that I had because it was just my reality. But it's like, you know, it is helpful to have everyone in the room know before I walk in it that if I go to the bathroom, it's maybe going to be 20 minutes and they should continue the party and they don't have to pause the movie because I'm going to miss it and it's fine. Um, and it just, it so that made things easier for me. And then in the broader context, so many people, I can't tell you how many people bring like rolls of toilet paper to my readings or bottles of Imodium. Right. And it, I think, I think it has freed up, at least in people who speak to me directly. I don't know if yeah. they're telling their friends about their diarrhea, but they do tell me. And I love that. I'm like, there are others of us out here going through the same thing. And like, you know, the shyness that I should have, <laughs> there's something about when, like, I don't know that I could go on the news. Right. And I mean, at this point I could, but in the beginning, I don't know if I could like go on the news and be like, this is what it's like when I go to the bathroom. Right. But when it's just like me and a computer screen, it feels like no one else, like I'm just like talking to myself, putting it out. It's, it's like, well, it's already written. People may as well read it. And so like having the feedback from people that like, mm -hmm. oh, it is, it's useful to me. It's helpful to know. I didn't realize people were struggling with this thing. Um, it has been a good like payoff for my extreme candor. <laughs> well, extreme candor, but you come out of this sort of boom in internet writing, right? Like the the era of the blog, as it were, mm -hmm. which is quite clearly dead at this point. But a lot of people were experimenting with storytelling and a lot of people who may not have heard or had the had the space to be heard is what I'm trying to say. We're suddenly out in the world, and you were one of the people who got a book deal. And yes, it started smaller than you know it mm -hmm. probably should have, mm -hmm. but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get to money at some point too. But the idea that you could sit down and say, "Hey, listen, this is my reality," and create community out of it. I mean, we live in these bodies that are fallible. At yeah. the bet, <laughs> also aging. <laughs> Oh, I, man. A, I, new, a new part falls off oh, every morning. <laughs> oh, there is some stuff where I'm looking at the women who came before me and I'm just like, hi, someone could have warned us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I'm not trying to make light of it. And you have, honestly, <laughs> you've dedicated three books to what? Clonopin, Wellbutrin, <laughs> and wait, Zoloft. So, Zoloft. I, you know, rock on. I we're not living in a perfect world. And the idea also that, you know, there was this conversation a few years ago about whether or not women were funny, which are you kidding me? Like <laughs> We can be gross and we can be funny and we mm. can be unladylike and really more of us should be unladylike. And um, obviously so that is my dream is just to kick that door open for more people to be raunchy and disgusting. Right. Which you're so doing. I'm not alone out here. <laughs> Yeah, you're not. But also, I mean, these books are trade paperback originals, so they're accessible. Mm -hmm. I mean, thank you for that. That is, okay, can we talk about that for yes. one second? That yes. is so important to me for two reasons. <laughs> one, I feel like when you get a hardcover book, like it's got to be about more than what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? It just feels like sort of rare. If I know you're going to, I know, I know what you're going to say, but 
hear me out. I just am like, I don't, these are not $30 books. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, yeah. I, okay, I will stop and say that these, I don't think they're $30 books, but also I really love just the idea that someone's like throwing a paperback in their bag mm -hmm. and getting on the train or yep. leaving it in the bathroom next to the toilet. Like that's <laughs> really my real dream is for my books to be all like waterlogged and smelling like farts because people leave them in the bathroom. Sam. <laughs> dream. That's what I, my bathroom books are sacred. I'm always like, oh, hello, you. Time for another chapter. <laughs> These books should be paperback books. I think, you know, my agent, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, your agent wants you to do like bigger and better and get more money. But I'm like, this is, this is my lane right here. You know, like I, my little paperback <laughs> lane, I think it works. We'll see. Maybe I'll write like something in a different genre and pop up with a hardcover but I it's so important to me that my books be like cheap and easily portable because like okay perfect example myself every time I get a new book you know because I'm insatiable for new things right I am like oh no but now I have to carry around a hardcover book am I going to read this <laughs> I have been known to order new books from like international bookstores yeah. because like they're too thick to have in hardcover, but you can get it in paperback. Mm -hmm. I don't want anybody to not read my jokes because, <laughs> because the book was too heavy. I'm thinking about your shoulders. I'm thinking about your hands. Okay. <laughs> But I'm also thinking about all of the people who need to know that they have community, right? Like yeah. that's for me. I mean, yeah, okay. I respect the whole portability. And <laughs> trust me, you should see my backpack. It's wild. <laughs> oh my god, you your spine must be concave. No, I have a backpack, and I look oh. like a six year old when I'm here. <laughs> I sort of waddle like you a little buckle across your chest. I don't actually use the little buckle, but I do. Okay. Like I have a very heavy city messenger backpack because it's the only way to carry. I can't carry the weight on my shoulder anymore. Yeah, no, no. And when I travel, I have a backpack too, like an old yeah. school Jansport. I we cannot be leaning to the side. No, it's totally. <laughs> see, this goes back to the aging thing. You just can't too sling it all over your shoulder yeah. anymore. <laughs> Yes, we are too old to not be fully upright. But also not not ready for large print yet. Like, let's be clear, we're not there yet. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I looked at, like, uh, my local bookstore has, a like, a section of large print books. And it really is, like, no offense to anyone who needs one. But when you open it, it's like, oh, wait, is this for kids? Like, it truly really is so big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is this a my a my first novel book? Like, uh, what is this? Well, chapter books. <laughs> I did love chapter books, man. We used to get the I can read books when I was little, and my brother and I would just race to the mailman. We're like, I want it first. I mean, and that's the thing. Like you say this all the time. I learned to write by being a reader. I mean, yeah. you were reading Stephen King and the Harlequin romances and Sweet Valley High and all of this. And I mean read whatever is going to make your heart go pitter patter. That's my thing. I just read yes. whatever. Like the worst thing for me is running out of stuff to read, which, you know, if you plan poorly, it has happened. <laughs> it is less likely to happen now that you can, you know, pop up a book on your phone. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like that was always the thing. Like I would go on vacation and half of my suitcases, but like, yeah. what if you run out of books to read? Yeah, on vacation? No, for, real. <laughs> for real. The beach very boring without a book by your side, especially if you're not swimming. Like, yeah. you need something. And I say this, like, not even taking into account that, like, my own writing is, I don't want to call it lowbrow, but it's not, like, purple prose. It's not, like, fancy, you know, blah, blah, blah. I am a 
huge advocate of like reading and watching what you want yeah. rather than like yeah. what you think will impress people. Cause every time I try to read like something someone told me was important to read, I just like get bored and, mm-hmm. and then I get like, am I getting the meaning? Do I understand it? Mm-hmm. Why did they tell me to read this? And like, I get preoccupied with that. I just like if you only want to read John Grisham novels, right? You should. Like, yeah. What makes you happy? I just want people to read. I just really want people to read, yeah. and just however you come to it. I do think, though, you know, I was also when I was a kid, YA wasn't what YA is now. So, like, suddenly I was punching above my weight, as it were. You know, reading stuff that you know you could argue was possibly not the most appropriate thing for 12 year olds to be reading but you know when you're a library kid and one of your godfathers is like literally the head of the library and just letting you you know figure out what's up that's right you know you end up being a book that's smart you, you end up like... being a bookseller <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have it in your blood oh completely i completely and i have to say you know quietly hostile is coming in and that's the new essay collection Quietly Hostile is coming into a world with a little bit of a different runway than, say, the earlier. Because, wow, no, thank you. When I was prepping for the show, and obviously I follow what's going on with you, and I know you don't read your reviews, but like, not only were you reviewed in the New York Times, and I love Pearl Seagal, and this is a great excuse to call her out because her review was fun. But you also got reviewed in the New Republic, which I super was not expecting. And again, I know you don't read your reviews, but it was a delight to see because suddenly, you know, and there you are on NPR and all of this other stuff. And I'm like, okay, it only took two books. It only took two books, which is faster than some. Yeah. But there you were. And suddenly everyone was talking about you and everyone was talking about, wow, no, thank you. And it was just so great to see that things were going as I planned. <laughs> it was lovely. To me, I just am like, I love it. and I. Like, you know, all I want is for my work to be useful in Mm -hmm. some way. Like, I've always said that. And so if people find it and like it, I think that's great. The people talking about you is, like, so stressful. Like, even to think about, that is the one thing, like, when another book comes out, I just think, like, oh, my God, more people are going to Mm-hmm. know who I am and have an opinion on how I am and what I say. I mean, the reason I don't read reviews is purely because I will fixate, even in a positive review, there's always something I will just fixate on it and never let it go, never forget it. And so it's better for me just to pretend it all doesn't exist because I'm trying to do my brain a favor. And also, like, I'm such a, um, there's no elegant way to say it. I'm such a people pleaser. When I hear criticism, I don't think like, oh, this person is wrong. I think maybe they have a point. How can I fix it? I Mm -hmm. can't fix, you know, like, what is there to fix? I would do nothing but fixing to make my work palatable for everyone if I took everything into account. And I don't want it to affect, I never sit down at the computer and think like, oh no, what are people going to think about this? And I don't want to start. Right, right. So I cannot read the reviews because I'm afraid (laughs) will infect my brain. Well, and you talk about this too in Quietly Hostile, which might be my favorite of your titles. I don't know. Uh, Wow, no, thank you. I say frequently, but quietly hostile. And like, I recognize that feeling. But you got some icky, and I'm being polite, you got some icky mail when you started working on and just like that. And I do want to talk about this fandom thing. And (laughs) because honestly, you are one of the voices that came out of the internet. I know I said that earlier in the show, but I'm saying it again, because it's true. I mean, you really like, There was this moment in the early aughts where, you know, yes, the internet was still the Wild West in a good way. And like, Mm -hmm. suddenly we're like, oh, this is fresh. This is interesting. Literary magazines or literary magazines love those too, but they have their own place in the world and everything Mm -hmm. else. And suddenly it felt like the playing field was different. I don't want to say level because it wasn't level, but it was different. 
And it was like, oh, click, click. I want to watch this or I want to or I want to read this, excuse me, because we hadn't yet done the pivot to video, which obviously we've done with this show, too. It's like, oh, hi. (laughs) Did I brush my hair? I think I did. All of the stuff that we do to get stories out. Right. And Mm -hmm. to get voice out. And I just you've always had this very distinct voice that I will follow anywhere, obviously. But you're mellowing a little bit and it's nice to see. But you had to walk through some muck. We're going to get yes. to the middle part. But you had to walk through some muck. And I do like this whole internet. I know you through the internet. I know who you are as a person. Actually, no, you don't. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> the feeling that a lot of folks have about fictional characters, whether they're on screen or on the page or whatnot, there's this intense emotion that comes with it. And in some ways, that's great. That's what art's supposed to do, right? You're mm-hmm. supposed to have feelings about art. But then sometimes it gets weird. <laughs> I will say that I, the first season of Sex in the City came out when I was 19, 20, somewhere yeah. in there. Okay. I did not have HBO, so I had to wait for it to come out on VHS and like watch it with my friends. I was as into this show and in love with these characters right. Right. as anyone, right? Mm-hmm. Like I have seen every episode dozens of times. I can quote it, like the whole thing. I am, and you know, I'm like passionate about a few like celebrities. I I would never say anything to anyone else about that. Like, it's just not me. And I'm not saying that uh, my way is the right way, but it just, it didn't occur to me. I, okay, I did not understand how big this show was like yeah. when when I started working on it because I had only written for small things that you know seven people watch right right, right. so I, no one had ever I, perfect example I worked on the second season of Work in Progress which was a show mm-hmm. on Showtime I wrote an episode with Lily Wachowski mm-hmm. which is like I mean I had to lie down just saying that, but yep. it was called FTP, which was like for the police. Right, right. It's not like a the police kind of episode, but you should watch it and you can see <laughs> what it's about. And I thought, so I didn't get to pick the title, right? Like it's Lily Shows. Right. <laughs> she picked it. And I saw, you know, you have to sign a thing like, it, like this is your episode. This is how we credit you, all that. And I saw the title and was like, oh, my God. Right, <laughs> like, right. What has just happened here? Go- yeah. You know, like, I'm going to get somebody with a thin blue line sticker on his truck is going to pull into my driveway and jump out and yell at me. And nothing. I didn't get a single anything. And it's because it's like a very small queer show right. on a smaller network, right? So like that had that to me, I was like, okay, maybe, maybe people are like cool about <laughs> this kind of stuff. And then and just like that came out. I'm like. I have never worked on a thing where like many articles are written about it before it even comes out. There's recaps and there's podcasts. And on the one hand, that is incredible. On the other hand, being a new person on the first season of a show that like used to be one thing and now is a different thing. Everyone, uh, not everyone, but everyone who got in touch with me in a negative way, like essentially like pinned the their complaints on the new writers. There were three of us, two black women and an Indian woman. Wait, only three. Wait, there were only three writers in the writing room? Or? No, no, three oh, yeah, new writers. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so you yeah, were the new one. Okay. Yeah. I just had a moment of what? <laughs> Yeah. That sounds physically impossible. What? No. no, no. Okay. So it's three, right. three okay. new ones. And it was like, look at our new writers. We're diverse, which is great. Yeah. But then all of the fans were like, oh, these are the people responsible for everything I hate about this show. 
And like when the show aired, just like, I mean, Rechna and I really got it. I don't think Kelly had like much of an internet presence. Right, so she right. thankfully was spared. And it's like, I did not know that was going to happen. I did not know people were going to be pissed. But also, I did not know how many people fundamentally do not understand how television writing works. Yeah. And like, I, it's like I was in charge of nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Like, I, I contributed my ideas. I wrote my episode. But like, I don't, I'm not the final boss. And so it was like fielding, and I think, you know, because my profile is a little higher, mm-hmm. like fielding all of this criticism for honestly work that I had a great time doing. I worked with incredible people. It was the most fun. Everyone is so nice. And then getting like, why is that braids joke in there? That's dumb. And it's like, well, I, first of all, that joke is funny. You're just being a hater. But second of all, I didn't like sign off on every joke, you Mm -hmm. know, like there's a hierarchy here and I'm at the bottom of it. So it was a crash course in working on a cultural juggernaut that I was ill prepared when I first started getting the lesson. I got it now. I have done all the things you need to do, meaning I got off Twitter. (laughs) I changed my Instagram uh, so that people couldn't like tag me yeah. in their critiques of the show. And it just, I don't know. We'll see. Season two is going to come out in a month. Okay. Maybe I'll call you and be like, girl, the same thing is happening again. I'm but it was, it, it was wild to, to not only like witness the vitriol, but then to have like a few people turn and point at me like this is your fault right it's like well first of all if I had my way a lot of things would have been different Terry would have been pooping in every single episode that's how you know I wasn't in charge okay but here's the thing you go from blogs where you're you know you don't have the profile that you have now Mm -hmm. we've got four books with hopefully more to come whatever they may be whether they're essay collections or you decide to do something i mean Uh, you wait till i tell you what's coming now okay well we'll get there we're not there yet a freak and then all of this television and so you're working across medium right like your media changes the voice doesn't change though which i love i just i so appreciate the fact that i know what I'm going to get with you, even if you're talking about something like grief or your body not working mm-hmm. or your anxiety and your depression or your, I don't really want to leave the house. <laughs> yeah. Like all of these things. And you left the city for the sticks. I mean, Kalamazoo is technically a city, isn't it? I mean, yes, but it's not... uh, It's not Chicago, but... No, but you know what? Can I admit here, maybe for the first time in public, that I kind of like it here. Yeah, of Um, course you do. You have a nice life. (laughs) Yeah, I do. And I can't... I could never live in a big city again, I don't think. I get it. It's, I totally get you it. Know, I mean, you know what I like is like all the middle-aged creature comforts. Like <laughs> uh, the restaurant has a parking lot. You know what I mean? It's like that stuff. You're never fighting for space in the grocery store. You right. know, it's like that kind of thing that I'm like, I go back. I went back to Chicago a couple of weeks ago to be the moderator for Allison Roman's like cookbook event. Yep. And just even driving into the city, I like, you know, coming down the skyway from Indiana. Yeah. Part of me is like, I love it here. I miss home. This is my home. I feel the city inside my body. But a bigger part of me is like, oh, <laughs> this traffic. It's so dirty. The sky is brown. You know what I mean? Just like, you know, I, completely uh, overwhelmed by the noise and the sounds and the sights. Yeah, but you also have some pretty good strip malls in Kalamazoo. And as a person Mm -hmm. who spends a lot of time in Los Angeles, 
you love strip malls when you live yes. in Los Angeles. So yes. like, straight up, there are great That's my favorite thing away. about LA. That is my strip favorite malls. thing about LA is strip malls. <laughs> I love Los Angeles. It doesn't doesn't seem like it would like work with my personality, but there is something about it. I could never go to New York again and be thrilled, but LA, I love so much. There's a lot to recommend this place. I mean, obviously I run back and forth between the two. I'm not here mm-hmm. full time. This place gets under your skin in the best possible mm-hmm. way. Um, I had an insane, insane dinner with friends on Sunday night. And we were down in West Adams and it was sort of this new fusion Thai restaurant that I shouldn't say new because it's been around for a minute. But I mean, it just makes me happy to be able to just run around so and great. eat a lot. Yes. <laughs> That's a great amazing. People there are so nice. Like maybe it's fake because like you know, they don't know whether or not you like own a movie studio. <laughs> so they don't know. They're like, let me be nice to you just in case. I don't care. I'll take it. I love it there. It's so easy, slow paced. It's really, it's really great. The weather. Uh, And the weather. The weather. Although when I lived out there while we were writing Shrill, Mm -hmm. um, I was reminded that it's a desert. I mean, the summer it's really something else. But I was in Palm Springs on Saturday and it was 102. <laughs> well, and we're walking around looking at art outside. Oh no, walking around. Oh, so this is why we have sunscreen and hats. <laughs> it's okay. fine. Sunscreen but do you have like hats. a personal refrigerator? Because I would need that too. Sunscreen and hats and like a nice lunch in the dark and it, everything worked out. But you know, okay, I, knew, yeah. I knew this was going to happen. I knew we were going to bump up, but I want to switch gears for just a second because okay. I want to go back to one of the earlier books because I did not know that you had a thing for Ben Affleck's movie, The Accountant, and I've now watched it because of you. And I have to say, you're right. It's pretty great. <laughs> it's so good. It sends me down a rabbit hole and I rewatch The Town and I rewatch Argo, both of which are fantastic. Like those I knew were fantastic movies, mm-hmm. except for all of the people who are not from Boston trying to do the accent. I'm like, you don't have, you're in the FBI. You don't have to do the accent. Oh, oh no. John Ham. They should have just said like, listen, you were imported to Boston from New wherever Jersey. It's you're fine. from originally. <laughs> like you do not have to attempt the accent. <laughs> Jeremy Renner in that movie is so good. But listen, people are so rude about Ben Affleck, and I'm not sure why. Or like what he's done to get clowned on. But he seems like a nice person. I mean, J-Lo loves him. Do we need any other proof that he's cool than that? I was one of those people who was like, well, this is interesting. (laughs) I don't have a lot of feelings about celebrity gossip, but I was like, huh. Didn't see this <laughs> Not that I would have anyway, but I love them together the first time. I love them together now. It's just like so funny. I just, they're like cute. They seem to be into each other, but it's also like hilarious that they're together. I, you know, I'll take what I can get. <laughs> but hilarity also, I mean, we need the funny man. We need we need to be able to laugh about the stuff that makes us profoundly uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And you know. Ex Bostonian, pretty much everything makes me profoundly uncomfortable. But I am slightly <laughs> less feral in my in my dotage. I'm getting a little less feral. But watching the evolution of you through these books has been really, you know, somehow we got off of Tommy Lee Jones and we ended up with Ben Affleck, which I totally get. But watching you learn how to be comfortable and safe and make a home, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's that hysterical piece in this it's in quietly hostile where you're talking about being in long-term temporary housing and you're like and then i went out and bought blankets and candles and (laughs) and it's like if you spend any amount of time on the road and i have in the past i've traveled quite a lot for work and it's like i can be in a hotel room and it's not going to be glamorous but i can make it home because for 48 hours sometimes 36 hours sometimes three days it's home where wherever i am physically is home and watching you you know, we remember the rooming house. Do we call it a crack house? I guess we call it a crack house. Yeah, like, let's call it a crack house. I mean, house. you were homeless a couple of times. You were taken in by friends. Like, you have had 
a community of people catch you multiple times. So the idea that you have this wonderful, loving life now makes me so happy for you. Oh, it's so important. This stuff is important. Like, yeah. Feral gets it's, exhausting. <laughs> truly, truly. One of the things that has helped me, like, I don't, you know, I always like jokingly say, I don't know anything, which is kind of true. But there are, you know, my parents died when I was a kid. And like, so I didn't have anyone to observe, right. like how to make a house, how to, you'd be an adult, how to like pay your bills, how to make financial decisions. Right. And I didn't uh, go to college. Well, I went to college for a year, but then left and I did some community college. Right. I, I never had time or space to learn those things. Definitely not money. And so I feel kind of like I'm learning on the fly, Mm -hmm. but also, you know, I feel good. Like, I don't feel as um, out of place as I used to in like adult life. Right. You know, like I, there are still, and I can be funny about it. There are still many things I don't know about Mm -hmm. a house, like person was like I have to go get salts for the water softener and like uh, what do those words even mean like (laughs) you know what I mean yeah I did where what where is a water salt like I don't know and I did not investigate further (laughs) I'm just just like okay okay girl here's here's the credit card do do what you got to do but it has also been like uh interesting fun to kind of do this growing up in front of people Mm -hmm. and like talking to the world about it yeah if for no other reason than like it helps me feel less bad and also maybe there's someone out there who like I don't know how to work a lawnmower you know Mm -hmm. what I mean just like real basic things um, that I am learning at 43 years old and I'm like I refuse to feel bad about this and also maybe someone else has this going on too and will benefit from right. knowing that I too am like you know where how do you work the dishwasher <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you, anything to do with water, hire someone. Anything to do with electric, hire someone like that. Is not oh, stuff. Yes. Oh, yeah, you do oh, not. No, we have a plumber and yeah. an electrician. Now, I am good at that. I am good All at right. being like, oh, uh, this broke. Beep, beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, boop. Oh, finding oh, a person. Okay. Come fix it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no. Person's like, oh, let me go find a wrench. And I'm like, you, <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> I'll be calling a guy who will be here after you break it further with your wrench. I I have helped assemble a bookcase, which is sitting behind me. Like I can do things like that, but thank you. But there are some things where you're like, "Mm, no, no, I'm a bookseller. I I'm not going to know. I'm going to call someone. (laughs) I don't want to live in a house that I built. (laughs) I want to know that someone who knew what they were doing put that together. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's one thing to be radical on the page and create a new kind of representation. It's another thing to put a wall up. And I have a cousin who's right. a master carpenter and he's very good at what he does. And it's amazing. But I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. I yeah. super can't do that. No. That's not me. And I would like, I can foresee as soon as the thing, like I'm this way about like putting together a shell. If it doesn't look like the picture, then I want to like smash it and yell and scream. You can't do that when it's like your window, your no. thing. So uh uh-uh. uh, I'm like, no. let's call somebody. There are people who got trained to do this exact yes. thing. Yes. Let's pay them. Yes, yes, <laughs> let's do that. Do you hear the evolution in your voice? Do you see the evolution in your work, or are you just too clear? I mean. Obviously, you mine your own life. <laughs> I'm a little too close to mm-hmm. really see it. I have noticed that um, I am swearing less and what? shouting what? in all caps a little less okay. in, in my work. Yeah, you know, yeah. Conversation no, I, yeah. me on the phone, it's an F-bomb every other second. Yeah, and I have less to be 
kind of personally enraged about. I still feel like my voice is the exact same as it's always been Mm -hmm. uh, because it's funny, like no matter what success or what I work on or what I do, I still have like an intense self-loathing. And I think as long as I have that, my voice will still sound like a person who hates herself, which uh, is like fine for the work. I should. Pro- I am in therapy. I'm on. Yay! <laughs> I wrote a whole thing about being in therapy, right? And forgot to turn it in. So next book, it's fine. <laughs> next book, <laughs> yes. there will be more. Yes. Yeah, so we'll talk about that ne- next. Next. <laughs> next time we'll get into how. Uh, I I try to do a comedy act for my therapist every other week. Uh, yeah, I can see you doing that, but at the same time, I just want you to be happy. So you know, like, I just want you I, to have a she, nice. She was like a, a couple weeks ago. She was like, I don't know what I was talking about, but she was like, Oh, you're finally letting me in, and I was like, We've been talking for nine months. You're in. And she was like, no, you put like that joke wall up. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting the real you. So I mean, surely by the time I have to write another book, she will be all the way in my yeah. brain. She will have set up residence in my brain and I can, I can Do write. You worry at all, though, that if you lose that sort of negative self-image, that shadow of the negative self-image that sits at the back of your brain, do you feel like you risk losing the funny? Yes. Oh, okay. for yes. Yeah. And you know, it's like, I don't know how to do, like, I've had no writer training, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, people who, who like write beautiful sentences or like that whole thing. I do not have that in me. And that's fine. Like, I don't, right. I don't need to, but I'm, it's also like, if, if somehow my, mental illness is miraculously yeah. cured and I'm okay with everything I, I just don't see it happening but if it did I the first thing to go I think would be <laughs> how funny I am because truly like I developed a sense of humor trying to offset every horrible thing that was right, happening right, right, right. or my perspective on everything, which is terrible slash like, when's the other shoe going to drop? Like I'm always mm. just like ready for things to be bad. So I, unless I get lobotomized, I I don't think I'm at risk for being yeah. cured. So I'll still be funny, but no, for real, the minute the writing feels like it's not good or people don't like it I'll just be done I don't need to hang on okay let's not say things like that (laughs) even if it's true no we're saying that like if if I can if I don't make you laugh like if you okay okay and you're like uh no I read an early copy uh this isn't it chief I would then be like okay maybe we don't do it anymore is that also partially an evolution though from being in writers rooms because i mean the work that you were doing before was incredibly solitary then you get your agent then you get your editor obviously and that changes it a tiny bit but that's still a very intimate sort of relationship and a writer's room you know you've got lots of inputs from lots of people and a shared sort of community that's a little different from the community you built in Chicago yeah. as you were coming up kind of thing. So yeah. has that sort of changed you at all or? It's, I mean, writer's room stuff, it feels so collaborative mm-hmm. that even when you write your script, everybody else's notes and jokes and pitches are all in there, right? Like right. nothing is ever you. And on the one hand, I would not feel comfortable making anything for television, that was just me, right? Because like, yeah. I miss things. I, you know, like if I lose the thread of something that's not interesting to me, the audience would be like, "What happened to that other guy?" You know what I mean? I feel like collaboration and TV stuff is key. I don't think it's changed how I feel about my own writing 
because I feel like my own writing is just me. Right. I'm like, okay. I only have to make myself laugh. I, the thing about TV is that, especially at my level, that I think I'm I'm at the highest level on this show, on and just like that, yeah, yeah. that I've been, which is supervising producer. It's mm-hmm. not high level, right? I get to make suggestions. I get, and it's a full, it's a room where like everything is encouraged. Uh, everyone, you know, no one is ever like, mm, you're new at this, shut up. Uh, <laughs> but it's still, so when you see a thing that has my name on it, it's not just me. It's like, right. you know, well, Julie thought of that storyline or Elisa, you know, put in this joke, which is great. But I still like having, me and my computer, just the two of us, me making myself last. And right. and because, I mean, Hollywood has rejected my personal ideas uh, more than one time. It remains the only place where I can do exactly what I want, yeah. how I want. Like, you know, I always like format my essays like kind of weird. Or sometimes yep. <laughs> there's a list and I, my editor never pushes back on any of that. They give me so much freedom. That's I truly, awesome. I mean, I'm not writing my own ticket, but it's as close as you can get, I think. Like, I don't get to pick my titles, but I do just get to put whatever. I, like, I don't have to turn in an outline. Can you believe? Mm-hmm. They just, they are like, do whatever, do whatever you want. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah. And then they put it all in. It's truly yeah. amazing to me. But I'm never going to have that on a TV show ever. Right. And which is good because I can have like the me that does TV stuff, but then the real me that's in right. the books. Um, I feel like those voices, like my voice is consistent throughout, but you're getting more of me from right. my own work. And I will always choose like my own stuff over TV. Well, there's also more Dave Matthews in this book than I was expecting, but I'm leaving that for, I am leaving that for read. I was laughing. I was just like, really Dave Matthews. Okay. I'm going to read this whole piece on Dave Matthews. I love you. I I know. I know. And I love that you love him, but I was laughing. I was like, I'm going to read a whole piece on Dave Matthews because Sam wrote it. (laughs) Can I tell you something incredible? Yes. Yes. My friend, Alex Papadimus Mm -hmm. is a, celebrity profiler i mean yep. he does a lot of stuff he writes books oh you probably know alex of course i know okay. um, i know his byline um oh, more I mean, than anything but that dude is incredible he texts me a few weeks ago and yeah. he's like hey can i interview you about dave matthews <laughs> and i was like yes <laughs> like i were, uh, are you kidding like no one ever wants to talk to me for more than one minute about him yeah so he calls we do this interview and i was like what is this for and he's like, well, I'm profiling him for Esquire or GQ, one right. of those. And I was yeah, like, yeah. oh, great. That's great. And you wanted an opinion from an idiot. Great. Love it. Can't wait to read it. So then he texts me later and he's like, do you have copies of the book? Because I'm flying to North Carolina to hang out with Dave and I would love to give him a copy. So I'm texting everybody yeah, yeah. at vintage yeah, yeah. like ship him a million copies <laughs> so they overnighted oh, a yes. copy to alex and i'm hoping that dave read it or at least touched it or mm-hmm. something he knows it exists which is enough for me <laughs> you know it works for me i, I mean a private concert would really like you know for me and all my friends you would come I'd I would you know what I would actually for that I would just to watch you watching Dave Matthews I would, I would totally cry. do that I just would weep the entire time and it's also if I could if I could get like a suggested playlist in there mm-hmm. if I was like oh make sure you make sure you do this one for me I would I would weep um, Sam Sam you wrote the suggested playlist <laughs> he wrote it that's, that's, I mean it's excellent and it's very you oh my god I I love him I'm sorry everyone I, and people are like oh stop apologizing is this a bit you love Dave Matthews like, it's, it's fine not a bit I, I do love him <laughs> I love him <laughs> so what's next okay well 
I just, speaking of my success, I just had a show in development rejected. Uh, sorry. <laughs> After like two years of development. I mean, one day we'll talk about oh, yeah. how <laughs> bonkers. I, it just. It's a whole separate, that is a whole oh, separate conversation. Oh, God. And now the guild is on strike, so yeah. I'm not doing any yep. Hollywood work right now. This book, Quietly Hostile, is the first in a three-book deal, which... Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, the, my agent structured it, though, so that <laughs> I only get paid one at a time. Mm-hmm. And if I decide I don't want to do the next one or the one after that, I can get out of it. Okay. I was like, uh, <laughs> I was like, three books feels like a lot of books. Um, I just talked to my editor the other day, mm-hmm. and we talked about our next path for the second book in this three book series. Mm-hmm. I am going to take some of the best slash most popular pieces from my old blog that mm-hmm. I unpublished so that I could. Steal yep. from it, and I'm gonna like react to those essays and like kind of have That's a conversation a with my 30 year old self that is because a my good idea. thank you. Okay, thank good. It, Maria and I are the only people who uh knew about it, and we thought it was a good idea, but it's good that you think so. I, no, 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 I add me to the list of people. Okay, no, I love that idea because <laughs> there is some stuff that I'm curious to see how you feel like it's aged because yeah. I mean, and it's true like you look back at some of the books you love like I can think of a couple of things that I loved in my 20s that I'm like wow <laughs> wow yeah. yeah wow like don't ever need to read Tropic of Cancer again by Henry Miller and if you've met me at 18 <laughs> Ugh, I mean, like, you were what? like, this is the one. Oh, I, this it's all is. about freedom and standing on the lip of the volcano. I mean, I was 18. I didn't know anything. So. <laughs> I love that, though. I love the passion of young people. Oh, totally. Who have totally. not had their bubble burst yet. I also love seeing the bubble burst and having them be like, oh, this is reality. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but we get to evolve. I mean, that's part of the beauty of it. Like, I'm, I just, I can't, please just when you have time work on that book, because I really, I do want to see how like settled down, married Sam is in conversation with 30 year old, very messy, though adorable Sam. So messy. It's (laughs) And you know, I don't reread my old stuff, right? So I, I, I gave Maria like uh, the password to look at the blog so she could go in and find things that she wanted me to like confront as a real adult rather than the fake adult I was back then. So that's next. And then after that, I'm going to do another one of these, like what's (laughs) going on. Here's, here's, uh, maybe I'll do have done some more Hollywood stuff by then. Mm -hmm. I can talk about or I could talk about this show that just (laughs) my books are all just gonna be filled with failed Hollywood show attempts I'm just gonna be like well okay they didn't want the one about me they didn't want this uh freaky one that we worked on for two years I just you know thank god I have the book so they can salvage my (laughs) Hollywood dream as long as it's funny, I think we'll all just follow you wherever you go. I mean, that's right. Really, but I love, I, I, my be. eyes are really big thinking about the next one. <laughs> I'm just like, wow, what a good idea, though. Isn't that, I mean, it's a I really good idea. Do, you know, I love Heidi Julevitz. Yep. And I, I was, I love, there's that one book that's, it's almost like a diary. Yep. Where it's just like, I, this, this is what I woke up thinking about today. And I thought like that, could be fun like this is you know rather than like hey I went here and this thing happened and here's 5,000 words about it just like a little bit on like how I felt at the store today or what I saw over here what's happening on this show so I thought I was going to do that and then I was like "Mm, let's take a dip into the archive (laughs) and humiliate myself again no, 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 no. hold on hold on it's not that it's not actually 
an act of humiliation. It's an act of optimism because we get to see your evolution as a human being, as Samantha Irby. You get to see your evolution through your editor and your publicist and all of the booksellers because I'm not the only bookseller who's jumping up and down going, this is a great idea. Please do this. (laughs) Thank you. I it's okay, a really that makes good idea. Me, that makes me feel really good because I didn't know we were talking about it. I was like, uh, uh, I don't know. But OK, now that you are in, I'm fully in. I honestly wish more folks who came out of sort of your same era would go back and think about doing that because we're all allowed to evolve. Right. Mm-hmm. We're all allowed mm-hmm. to evolve. And hopefully as a human being, we try for that. Not everyone. Yes. Does, but, you know, we try for it. Right. But to have that as like something someone can pick up and dive into your brain. Yeah. Oh wow. I'm I It's I mean it's a I really like, good idea. <laughs> this blog is like kind of a gift. So one of the things about my tragic childhood is that like all of I've no I very few, maybe like three pictures from my childhood because right. right. my mom's like albums who knows where they ended up. But so I was thinking about that. And then I was like, wait a minute, I have this gift of all of these like written, published memories, things like what did I care about? What, you know, it's I'm I'm really uh, fixated is the wrong word, but it's the only one I can come up with fixated on like when you don't have a trackable past. Right. Like when. Because, like, I could say whatever, my parents are dead. I mean, I have sisters who could corroborate it, but no picture proof, no this, right. no that. And so, like, it feels like it's, like, unmooring to have that. It's like, well, there's, what was my life until I started saving things for myself? But the blog is, like, a in amber, like, what I was thinking, yeah. what I was doing, where I went, how reckless. I was, yeah. and it'll be, I mean, I, I got to figure out what lens, I'm going to try to do a bunch of lenses, like, would I do this again, yeah. or am I embarrassed about this, or how, what would I say to me mm-hmm. then? Maria says I have 11 months to pull it together, so That's I'll not start very long. 10 months from now. It's <laughs> not very long. <laughs> no, it isn't, but she knows. She has to tell me things are due next week in order oh, for me. Right. To okay. Come. I get it. I, I trust myself. I'm like, oh, I know. I can just sit down and write this. And then I don't. But I'm like, well, I could do it tomorrow. And that, you know, and on and on and on. I think, did you get a galley copy? I do have, I'm working off a galley of. It's Quietly incomplete. Hostile, which, oh, it's incomplete. It's oh, no. What am I missing? An essay about QVC. And how much I love QVC because I turned it in so late that they couldn't get it in the galleys in time. Well, then I just get to get read you again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the horror, the horror. Oh, no. I have to read Quietly Hostile a second time. Oh, no, no, you just have to read the one essay. Okay, the one essay. But still, you know what's going to happen is I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to start laughing and then I'm just not going to stop laughing. And I'm not going to put it down because this is what happens when I pick up one of your books. And, you know, also, I, they delight me to no end. Just everything that you're doing. And I just, I really want to keep stressing this because I'm me and this is what I do. And I re- <laughs> I repeat myself sometimes. But more importantly, what you did with Meaty was radical and different and set up. I mean, all props to Lindy West and Shrill, but you made it possible for people like Lindy to get book deals. Yeah. And I think that's really important. I just really want to acknowledge that you started a thing. You started a moment. Yeah. And I just want to make sure you get credit for that because it's a big deal. It's a really big deal, Sam. Oh, thank <laughs> you. I I get so excited, heart warmed, whatever, when I see new essay collections yeah. coming out. Because I do, not in like a, you know, self-satisfied way, but I, I mean, my publisher told me I can't remember maybe this was after wow no thank you they were like we started a whole new because vintage used to just do reprints of hardcover <laughs> oh, I know. Books. oh yeah you of course <laughs> of, of course you know they tried originals too there's a whole little history but 
you actually changed a trajectory there as well. Yeah, they 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 do a whole originals. They have a whole originals section now, and they were like, "It's because of you." And I don't a hundred percent believe that, but I kind of do. (laughs) Like I have done well for them and it makes me so excited that more people can can do this and that you don't I think the thing I'm most proud of is like I don't have an MFA I never went to any programs I don't like all my writer friends are like dirt bags right like I don't know people who are like (laughs) sorry big fancy writers I love that like I didn't have to do any of that one to write a book or to have that book or several books be successful that is a big point of pride for me like to show people that like listen you could spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars on an MSA or you can just be really honest and hope that someone likes it like just I think one one thing that like gets me yeah as a person Mm -hmm. and as a especially now as a creative person the gatekeeping is crazy I mean people want to keep you out of stuff you don't even want to be in right it's like you don't have to shield that from me I don't want it I'm not going to take it from Mm -hmm. you I like the feeling of opening the door rather than like shutting it like that makes me that makes me feel good. There's enough for everybody. It doesn't take away from me right. to have other people be successful. So that, uh, I, honestly, like that makes me really, really proud. If anyone gets a chance taken on them because of me, then that that it's worth it. That's what it's for. And that is a really, really good way to end this episode because I love you to bits. And that's just a really excellent high note. Though I will say you do read all of your audiobooks and big shout out to that because hysterical, absolutely hysterical. And also okay, if you're I'm reading, gonna, can I tell you one thing? Yes, of course you go? can. Yeah, no, totally, totally. So I got a new director this time. Uh oh. And no, no, it was it's good. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh I loved loved him L- like marry me, Sean. Okay. Runette. But the best part. And he was really great. And he encouraged, you know, I need a little like acting coaching. <laughs> so he he like helped and whatever. I wrote an essay about and just like that, which is really about Sex in the City, the original right. show. I finished reading that on the audiobook, and he he's like, Hey, can I tell you something? And I'm fully expecting him to be like you you really messed that up yeah so i'm like uh sure and he's like do you remember that episode where miranda goes to the comedy club and the comic is rude to her and i was like yeah and he's like i was the comic Okay, so six degrees of separation from sex and yeah, for you, like everything I you do. I screamed. I was like, and then I was really like starstruck, and I kept, I like remembered his lines and was like saying them to him. Mm-hmm. It was really, it was like a full circle magical moment. Completely. But yes, I read my audiobooks, and they, I mean, I try to make them fun. I hope they're fun. Oh. Oh, excuse me. Yes. <laughs> Having listened to them. Yes, they are fun. Wait a minute. How is that a question? Samantha? Well, because I can't listen to my own voice for more than yeah, a few I get seconds. It. I get it. So oh. I have not listened to them. <laughs> I, get it. I, just, I respect to anyone who has a podcast, especially you, though, because I love you, <laughs> because I could not do it. I could not listen to my own voice for more than a minute. You learn to get over it really, really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of what happens. You just have to say, okay, I want this conversation out in the world because <laughs> I get to talk to people I love a lot of the time. And then I just get to talk to a lot of cool people a lot of the time too. So I have no complaints. <laughs> oh, well, God bless you. I can't, I, my ears would bleed. I, 
episode one, grand opening, grand closing, because <laughs> Sam could not stand to listen to her own voice. God, I shouldn't be saying that on a podcast where people no. are hearing my No, voice. no, no. Here's the thing. You keep writing the books. And you just come on, we talk about the books for a little bit, and then you can go back. (laughs) Okay, great. It's a different thing when you're doing two or three hours a week. That's a whole different thing. But this, I could do this every week with you. Oh, me too. Me, I I knew this was going to happen too. I was like, we're going to talk, and I'm just going to be like, can I come to your house? (laughs) Please, please, anytime. But on that note, Sam Irby, Quietly Hostile is out now. If you haven't read Wow, No Thank You, or We Are Never Meeting in Real Life, or Meaty, start with Meaty, really. Just go back to Meaty for a second. Sam Irby, thank you so much. I adore you. I'm so happy we got to do this. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I adore you forever and ever. I'm so glad. I will come on anytime. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.